I'm Zibby Owens, and this is Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. As a mom of four kids in New York City and a writer myself, I know all too well how short everyone is on time, so I'm here to help. I'm going to interview authors and writers of all types about their work, especially as it relates to parenting and family issues. Hopefully you can listen while doing 8 million other things and fall in love with these talented scribes and their fantastic books, essays, and songs like I have, plus get some tips on surviving parenthood. For more about me, you can check out my essays at zibbyowens.com. Also, this episode has been sponsored by Chloe's Fruit, the cool way to eat fruit. Just fruit, water, and a touch of organic cane sugar. I don't know about you, but my kids are obsessed with Chloe's Pops. I secretly sneak the dark chocolate pops when they're not looking for a guilt-free delicious treat. Check them out on chloesfruit.com. I am beyond excited to be talking to Andre Agassi today. Andre Agassi really needs no introduction, but just as a refresher, Andre used to be ranked number one in the world in tennis and won eight Grand Slam singles championships. Now married to Steffi Graf, Andre has two children and is involved in launching charter schools with the Turner Agassi Foundation and is on the board and one of the initial investors of Square Panda, a product innovator in AI education. Plus, Andre Agassi wrote one of my favorite books of all time it's called Open, which I'll talk about tonight. Hi, Zimmy. How are you, Andre? Hi. Thanks so much for doing this. This is such a treat for me. Oh, sweet. You uh, uh, appreciate all your kind words. Are you? Uh, is this something? Uh, tell me a little bit about your podcast, if you don't mind. Well, I actually just started my podcast. I'm I'm a writer, so I do a lot of writing for magazines, and um, I've been doing a lot of online writing, especially about parenting lately. I have four little kids. So, um, that's my main focus. Um, I was going to write a book called moms don't have time to read books. Um, but my agent <laughs> or said, write books. yeah, exactly. <laughs> but my agent said, you know what, that might be better as a podcast and you should just write another book. And so I said, well, actually I really want to write a book called 40 love about tennis and falling in love and everything. So that's how this came about. Um, and the podcast is going to feature Um, authors and books that I've loved or articles I read that I think are amazing. Um, And I'm hoping to sort of distill those things for the moms who might not have time to read the full thing, but want a taste of it, or even just as a preview so they can go buy it themselves. Oh, nice. Very nice. So that's that's my... uh, That's very very (laughs) ambitious. I know. So so we'll see. (laughs) But uh, (laughs) this will certainly certainly help. Um, So what made you write open this amazing book? It's Oh, it's a good good question because uh, I never really saw myself as ever eventually writing a book. I kind of always looked at it like a like a glorified press conference or, or or something when I would read other autobiographies, and then and then I really got I really got to the point where um, I just kind of wanted to understand my own life through a through a literary uh, lens. I wanted to to sort of um, make sense of my life, if you will, uh, from my own for my own um, uh, desire to understand it in its context. It's the life I've lived was sort of never gave me a chance to take much in. And, and, and I, and I went about the process, I think in a way that uh, really was uh, organic. I, I, I finally read a book that I fell in love with uh, called the tender bar written by J.R. Mulringer. And, and it, and it hit me that a person's story can really be, really be a powerful tool to impact lives and uh and i knew i wanted to do it with him and probably wouldn't have done it without his you know dedication and collaboration and when i finally talked him into it he moved to vegas for two and a half years and um and we decided to do it and then decide later if it's something we're really going to turn over or not and it wasn't really designed in the beginning to be something i was going to hand the world unless uh unless i truly believe people would be better off uh, in their own lives for sharing a bit of uh, my experiences as it ties to, to their journey. Have you been pleased with the reception? You must get just raves about it. I mean, I know it's one of my favorites of all time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it. It feels like I get more proud of it as time goes on. I mean, uh, it feels like a little bit of lifetime since the book, but, uh, but as it relates to words living long past us, I assure you that's the case. And, that warning was given to me by my partner, um, a collaborator, JR, and he just said to me, you know, listen, uh, every word will live past us. And 
as a result, um, let's choose carefully. And, uh, and, and, and anybody that has read it has only sort of, uh, you know, they, they find themselves drawn in different, you know, parts of the journey, um, that I think really reflects something that makes me very proud because my goal was to sort of say, you know, tennis was maybe the platform that I had, but, um, but we all deal with fears. We all deal with, you know, uh, identity. We all deal with, you know, taking ownership of our lives. We all deal with so many of these same themes. And, and I, mine was lived so extremely, um, and publicly, uh, that, that pulling the curtains back, um, um, was something that, um, you know, I was really, uh, anxious about in one respect, but then, but then very proud about, um, you know, in another. And you, you mentioned uh, at, the, at the very end of your book that part of the reason for doing it was to help your kids out and have them learn more about your journey. Is that true? Or? Yeah, well, I, I definitely wrote it uh, through their eyes, meaning, uh, meaning, you know, they were the first filter I used in anything that eventually, uh, you know, made the, made the cut because it needed to be me, you know. I mean, I, one of my great fears before my children were, um, you know, old enough is that somehow something may happen to me where they wouldn't know who, who, me or who, or, or who I was or, or, you know, how I felt or what I believed or, or, or what I went through and, um, achieved, overcame, you know, uh, failed at, you know, I just, uh, just a sto- just my story. I, I wanted it to be able to read well through, through their eyes, I wanted it to really be true to me uh, for them first and foremost. You know that was there's, there's there's no question. But then as you as you get into it, you you realize that this is this is broader and has bigger you know Im- implications to to people's lives. Um, you know even even across you know cultures. Um, and that's one thing I've seen to to stay pretty true. That's great. In uh, in the book, you describe the physical agony of getting up to play many times. One quote that I loved was when you said, "Hate brings me to my knees; love gets me on my feet." Uh, can you describe these opposing for- forces and how you spent so much of your career sort of pushing through pain um, to achieve such greatness? Yeah, you you, you dedicate your whole life, uh, you know, to be a, uh, an athlete, especially in the sport of tennis, uh, and 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 you know, well accomplished. You know, you're doing, you're giving your whole life to it, starting from a child. So you, you really kind of spend a third of your life not preparing for two thirds of your life, and much of that wear and tear, um, uh, you know, goes goes on your body. And between the twisting and the turning and the sprinting and the stopping and the jumping and the starting, I mean, all of it is just a, a just an, an ongoing abuse that you try to recover from sometimes on a daily basis. And then when you add years upon years and you add some physical limitations as well with the with the anatomy of my particular back and hips you know it was just i got to a point where i played long past when my body told me to to stop and it was getting you know all too obvious you know towards the end and you know i found myself sleeping multiple times on the on the on the on the floor uh just for the sake of what i couldn't abide by in in, in, a, in a in a hotel room you know mattress i found myself uh, you know just having a much harder time standing up straight after some long matches and you know i start the book with with the end which was my last uh, basically my last match and and uh and and the end uh you know started with me trying to get up off the floor it's like my eyes open i hear the kids in the other room and and you know it's my body sort of the pain brings me to my knees it takes me to the floor and it was the it's the love and 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 also craving for caffeine that gets me to my <laughs> uh, that gets me to my feet because uh it was you know it's hard it was like a it was a literally a five minute process to to, to get up uh, so i don't do anything too startling to to, to you know to my to my body and with with the day's objectives another quote that i love that you said was one thing i've learned in 29 years of playing tennis life will throw everything but the kitchen sink in your path and then it will throw the kitchen sink <laughs> can you can you speak to <laughs> what you meant by this and how you've you've worked your way through that as well yeah you know it's um when, you know one of the sport of tennis is a is a is a, is a eat you know, eat what you kill, uh, kind of, kind of sport, you know, you don't, you know, if you, if you want to survive, it's going to come at somebody else's 
you know demise and 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 with that sort of intensity you know you 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 have to suffer through so many so many personal um um uh, limitations because you just don't know what the other person's doing you know when we're out there competing it's it's a result of so much preparation and and the scoreboard just tells kind of one part of it and 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 it's kind of the it's kind of the judge and jury for that moment but but what you do before what you do you know uh, after in recoveries what you do in all your preparation i mean you're always chasing this ghost because you're thinking to yourself well somebody else is working harder or somebody else is doing doing more and so these little setbacks that you get along the way whether they be physical or 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 discouragements you know and failures you know you just you live it alone um and you live it very intensely because because you're you you literally believe you're the only one really going through this. You don't have the objectivity to recognize that this is the reality of you know the life chosen. You know, and so so you you constantly feel like you're getting hit with with obstacles and, and pressures and challenges, and your whole day becomes about what you need to do to to be at your best and to make sure you get one day one day better and 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 never try to get two days better because that's when you risk taking steps backwards and so it's this ongoing 24-hour sort of negotiation with yourself that it's almost like a post-traumatic you know, <laughs> syndrome where you where you, you suffer so much internally that nobody knows that you you kind of you know it, it exposes itself in some in some odd ways and and uh you know and, and for me it, it did in a lot of my personal choices uh the things that i i chose to escape some of the pains um the pressures um some of the decisions i made with my um you know with my judgments on 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 decision making friends i chose to 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 be friends with um you know bad decision uh, or you know I, i'm not to criticize um you know uh, the mistake of 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 a of a failed marriage but but when you fail yourself you know it's impossible not to fail somebody else and so you know there's just there's just many things that when you thought it couldn't get couldn't get harder it couldn't get worse it did wow i'm sorry <laughs> you worked through uh-huh. it so beautifully um, I love how you weave the day-to-day of parenting throughout the book in scenes that anyone can relate to, like the kids begging for a dog and having playdates, not being able to sleep past 7.30, which, by the way, I thought was really late, which is great. Um, and then, like, they don't <laughs> well, seem but to... But I did mention I did mention in the book that I got to sleep until 7.30 because of my wonderful wife. So yes, that's true, and <laughs> that's made it, nice. You made it possible. <laughs> that's a, always good to give credit where credit is due. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, no doubt. Uh, but so funny that there you were, right, preparing for the finals of the U.S. Open, but they're just kids, right? It's like you're just their dad. What was it like for you to be so revered and so in the public eye and yet at home, you know, just be the guy who runs the bathtub? I mean, I feel like Roger Federer must be going through some of this today with his four kids. Like, how do you manage that difference? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think everybody's wired differently. You know, I, I mean, I, I know Roger to a to a, a certain degree. He seems like as down to earth as a person as you you can be. I mean, certainly he has a respect for 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 all cultures and and people, and he's a deep knowledge of of history in both life and tennis. So I would I would imagine there's some real context that he has off the court. Other other you know other people in the public eye, you know, they might choose. They might believe what they read. I, I don't know. For me, I, I relished getting away from the hat I felt like I had to wear when I was in the public eye. You know, I I never felt really authentic um, when I was out there. Um, I mean, I, I did come to terms with this being a talent of mine, but loving tennis was not who I was. I actually hated it for most of my life uh, for a lot of reasons, um, and and I would get out there and and struggle with my purpose and reason. I found my reason finally and, and, and giving choice to other children through education and and that became my my distraction from myself when I was out there. And so when I had children it actually it actually in some kind of odd way made it a lot easier for me because I was able to really escape the the, the it was so real and it was so who I was. Um, that it was a relief to me to have 
the responsibility of of being a dad and 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 to quite honestly feel uh normal and to feel like tennis just went away a good day or a bad day just like disappeared when when your kids come running down the the hallway because they hear the elevator open up at the hotel you know and they think it might be you it's like it's you know so it was a it was, I, it was a real asset and i was really blessed to to have five years where i could have them you know with me uh during some of those um times when i think i would have felt um felt pretty lonely not 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 having them um in the book you describe not liking school and not doing well in school something that i'm sure many kids and parents I uh, can relate to you. You said, I don't seem to learn or process facts the way other kids do. I have a steel trap memory, but t- trouble concentrating. I need things explained twice, three times. How did that experience make you feel? And how do you think that experience of your own has tied into your passion for providing education now to students around the world? Yeah, I think my lack of education has been a big inspiration uh, to that. Um, um, you know, the biggest reason being, you know, I, I mean, I, I describe very, very particularly in the book, you know, the life I was living as a child. It was, it was the life of a professional. It wasn't the life of a, of a, of a, of a kid, you know. And so I was always getting pulled out of school on Fridays for tournaments in Southern California at the age of seven years old to drive down, play all weekend, drive back late Sunday get up, go to school. And, and, you know, I, I always felt, I always felt behind. I never felt rested. I never felt ready for it. Um, uh, in our house, it was wake up, play tennis, brush your teeth, go to school. And in that order, you know, it was mm-hmm. really, it was really the way it was. So school wasn't a priority to my father, um, um, whatsoever. And, and, and so I was always kind of a behind and I was always tired and, and, I might even had some learning, you know, deficits, you know, and, and, and as a result, I, I never quite knew why I felt the way I felt, but I, I shunned away from it. Um, I, I, I resented it. I felt like resenting school was loyalty to my dad, you know, and I believed tennis was what I had to do was I never had a choice. So as a result, that lack of choice eventually, um, as my own, as I grew up and I got I started to sort of grow into my own voice, I I was pretty clear with how much I resented not having that choice. And you know, I never really liked how tennis made me feel as a child. I never liked that it affected family dinners, depending how good you played that day. I never I never liked you know how it made me feel and every morning when I when I was had, having to go to school. And you know, so there's so many things early on I didn't like. I didn't like. The relationship it established, uh, tennis seemed to, to put a wedge in between my siblings and, 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 and my father. And, and so there's so many moments growing up where I just, I just resented not having that choice and, and the pressure being on me to be the one to do it. And, and so I think when I really hit my lowest point, 27 years old, I'd fallen from number I, I was convinced that getting the number one in the world was going to be my answer, you know, and, and that somehow there, there was going to be some fulfillment and that and that and that goal and objective and i i just remember getting the number one and literally feeling nothing feeling like just empty it was weird it was like i'm number one it was almost worse being number one because (laughs) i was i was i was let in on this dirty little secret that it's doesn't change it doesn't change a darn thing you know and and so uh, i had to i had to go through a real tailspin in my life uh, and I did, and I, I, and I self-inflicted with choices of drugs and choices of lifestyle, and and found myself in a marriage that I that uh, was quickly failing, and fell to 140 in the world, and and then that's when I saw on TV after I had one of my worst losses, my coach basically told me we're going to quit or start over, and. I just remember that moment. It was such a it was such an epiphany of a moment. I mean, epiphanies don't change our life. What we do with them is really what changes our life. But my epiphany was seeing so many people out in the streets and wondering what they did, if they loved what they did, if they even chose what they did. You know, what I mean, did have they did they choose their life? Did they have a choice in where they were born and what was nurtured and what their strengths and weaknesses are? So I kind of started to go. You know what? Just because I didn't choose my life doesn't mean 
that I can't take ownership of it and I can't find my reason. So that was my epiphany. And, and, and I, I searched for my reason from that day forward, which led to me seeing a 60 minutes piece on Kip knowledge's power program, which is a, 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 one of the most renowned charter school operators in the country. And, and I saw, I saw these people changing these children's lives by rolling up their sleeves and, and giving them choice. I saw what it meant for a child not to really have choice. Here I was bitching about being number one in the world when, <laughs> when other kids who don't have choice can't escape the downward spiral of their, of their, of their, of their, of their own neighborhood and, and gangs and prisons and drugs. And, and so I said, you know what, that's what I want to do. It was like overnight, I took out a $40 million mortgage and, and I set about the Herculean task of building my own charter school and trying to figure it out and trying to pay for it and trying to do so many things. But, but what it did do, it, it gave me my reason. And, uh, and I think lack of education, seeing children who really don't have choice in their life, my own disconnect with the lack of choice in my life, I think those were probably the working components to what has made me so passionate about education. And now you have, what, 65,000 school seats and 80, 80 charter schools? It's amazing how you've expanded like that. How did that happen? Yeah. Well, that was, um, that was spawned off of, of 15 years of building my philanthropic school in Las Vegas. Um, you know, I started to realize not being an educator or an operator, I, I kind of said to myself, you know, well, what am I? If I'm not an educator and an operator, I realize I'm, I'm basically I've been a facilitator for, for these children. And, you know, I, I don't, I'm not in the classroom teaching. I'm not in the back of house organizing and, and operating. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm putting people in right places and trying to make the best decisions. And, and so one of the things that was hardest about that whole philanthropic experience was, 1,200 kids in my school and 3,000 on the waiting list, you know, and the need was so much greater. I looked at it like I was twice the failure. I was a success and I needed to figure out a way to, to expand this, this mission. And, and I guess sometimes when you, I don't know, when you dream when you're awake or when you pray hard enough or when life just sometimes puts the right people in your life at the right time. And I, and, and after my uh, book was written, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, my now partner, uh, had read it and he called me and said, you know, I share your same passion and frustration for education. And, and I think, I think together we can do some really interesting things. I went down and met with him and, and we ended up through his, his background of, of inner city, uh, you know, development and building. We, we put together a, an out of the box model that sort of said, you know, let's not wait for government to be efficient anymore. Let's not rely on philanthropy because we both have realized that it's not scalable. I mean, here you are with a waiting list and let's go to the private sector and let's, let's sell a model that doesn't ride the backs of our teachers, of our students or, or anything that we facilitate for these great operators, um, an ability for them to scale. And, 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 and so that's what we did. We put together this really interesting business model that allows us to bring capital to the table on day one, go with an operator to where they want to expand. There's obviously a need. It's not a software issue. There, there are plenty of great teachers inspired for a friendly learning environment. And it's a, it's a hardware issue. A, a charter school can't access public dollars to build their facility. But once you have your chartered license, then every child that goes to that school, the money from the state follows the child to that school. So there's a revenue model on day one in these communities where a charter is now expanding to. And and so if we could bring the capital to build a facility and then we can not play landlord in their life and, and allow them to fully incubate and, 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 and stabilize. And then through the taxes and bond market, you know, be able to get them a purchase power to buy back the school for a price that satisfies a like-minded investor, you know, which is an investor that says, I'm not looking to, to, to make huge returns. I'm not looking to give away my money or I'm tired of giving away my money, but, but I do want to see, I do want to be responsible in my, in, you know, I do want to see social impact. I do want to, I want to be responsible and, and, and what I do. So if we walk the tension between return on investment versus social, uh, you know, uh, scalability and sustainability. And, and with that model, 
you know, have deployed close to a billion dollars over the last five years and built over 80 schools. This week I go to Florida actually to, to, to open up a, you know, another one. So it's, you know, it's really been exciting and it's been a journey that I'm incredibly proud of and, and continue to find ways to, to, to impact the lives of so many kids that don't have, uh, you know, the, 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 the luxury that, that, that other kids do. Your education should not be determined by your, by your zip code. It just, it's not the way it should work. No, you're absolutely right. And I, and I read that you're developing, you're trying to develop the, a new, uh, met- a new measure for dyslexia that could be a universal, um, sort of symptom check to make sure that kids get the help that they need. Is that, t- can you tell me about the readability initiative you're involved in? Yeah. So I'm involved in, uh, I started this company, uh, with a few, um, with, I mean, I'm a, I'm a very, very early, early investor, uh, with, um, uh, called Square Panda. And it's, a it's a, it's a, it's a platform that, that allows us to give real time intervention to kids as it relates to, to early childhood reading. And so uh, let me just back up a step from there and say that as I've seen all these schools get built, as I've spent time with all these leaders and operators and teachers and, 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 and people that are, you know, in the weeds as it, as it relates to day to day educational life, the same, the same thing keeps coming up, which is, the uh, early childhood reading literacy, like the earlier a child reads, the earlier they can process and can comprehend content as opposed to just phonetically figuring out what the heck the word is saying. We're not, we don't, we haven't evolved to read. You know, reading is about seeing something, associating a sound with it, tying it with another letter, pronouncing those two together, making a word, then going to the auditor uh, where you have to say the word and then you say the word and then you associate it with this meaning there's like six or eight things going on in a brain just to read and the great news is is that we have so much science and neuroscience uh, behind this to understand these batons and how they're getting passed back and forth and where a child struggles because when a baton isn't lit up as much as other areas with these salt water um, like I'm, I'm, I almost call them like shower caps. They're very non-invasive. You just wear it. They they get a child to interact with a game or to do something, and you can actually predict the uh, high percentile where the struggling points are going to come with with a child, and then you can help meet them where they are and develop those muscles. So, so I, I put this in my school to to test it, and I was amazed at how fast some of these kids that really struggled got caught up to speed and even went past their peers in, in, in these case studies that I was able to do at my school. So that merited my complete commitment to this expansion because when you want to talk about scalability, if you can if you can create a platform that that is in the tech world that, that really allows for children to 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 be personalized uh, in in self directed um, reading and, and, and learning from ages of two to seven now you're talking about real implications, but this doesn't just have implications when it comes to reading. It has implications when it comes to red flagging dyslexia, as an example, because the earlier you detect this dyslexia, I mean, you can, you can, people, a lot of people don't realize it. They don't know they have it until it's sixth grade. You know, by then it's costing $14,000 a year remediation. But if you can, if you can recognize these sorts of things and, you know, by the age of four, I mean, now you're, now you're talking about, getting rid of managing it, remediating it, and then not ever having to worry about it ever again in, in a, an incredibly short period of time. So the success that we're having on that end, it has language, second language, teaching, uh, uh, you know, possibilities when the brain, when the brain is most, you know, uh, you know, uh, of, you know, when you can mold the brain, it's like it's elastic when you're really young. I mean, the, the se- second language learning acquisition huge implications there. So anyhow, this has been about a couple of years and we have a big business in, in China and the United States and it's growing and scaling. And, and I believe it's, it's, um, it, it kind of makes what I'm doing with the schools seem pretty uh, one dimensional of sorts, you know, because they're standalone schools that are affecting 1500 kids in perpetuity, say in each school. But this is about reaching, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not, if not millions. 
That's amazing that you're doing that. I know for sure I'm going and getting these the square panda starter kits for my little kids now after this, <laughs> for sure. Um, just uh, going back to tennis for a minute, um, you know, I, I, I am married to a, a former tennis pro who watches the tennis channel religiously, and the tournaments are just back to back to back to back. And I'm wondering how you feel about sort of the insanity of the of the tour schedule and what it does to players' bodies these days. Yeah, it's pretty. It 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 does appear that way. I mean, I I I can honestly say that um, that um, it, it, you know I would I think the sport would benefit a lot more from a more sustained off off season um, for a couple reasons. There's a lot to be said for the quality of a sport when you know you can properly you know recover from a season and prepare for the season. So I think the quality. Will raise. I also think the fans will look forward to it more, and um, and and I think you can make it work. We're we're pretty fragmented in the ownerships of of these tournaments, and and uh, and, and and you know, and some and some guys, you know, they want to be out there grinding away because the more they play, the better chance they have for their for their ranking. So you're you're almost taking away opportunities in some respects. In other words, if you if you talk to the top. I don't want to speak for any player, but if you speak, if if you were to just generally speaking, you talk to the top fifteen guys in the world, they're going to want an entirely different schedule than than the guys seventy five to a hundred in the world. You know, so it's kind of hard to to make everybody happy, but you would love to see the sport move forward in in the best interest of its own future. But these these guys have short careers, and some they're getting longer, of course, uh, as we're seeing with with Roger and, and Rafa and. And I, I know guys are playing into the 30s now, but even if you play into your mid 30s, it's it's you get a window of time, and then your time's over with. And guys want want their opportunity to be out there to play. Hmm. Didn't think of it like that. Um, and how uh, how did you find coaching versus playing? Uh, it was interesting. You know, it's uh, when I played, uh, I never felt pressure. At all, it was. It was never about pressure. It was. I felt stress, like stress to, you know, take every box and make sure everything, you know, organization. I just, you know, you just you don't want curves. You have your rhythms. You have your, you know, your 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 style of going about getting ready for practices for matches. Um, you know where to spend energy. You know where not to, you know, and, and and so you manage your day and all the details that go into making your day the best it can possibly be. And that that was stressful because you're constantly thinking about it. But then once you get out there, everything's in order. It's like you know you just hit the gas pedal and just go and hope for the best, you know. But coaching was the exact opposite. You know, I, I never felt any stress because I didn't really have to do anything. You know, it wasn't me <laughs> executing. It wasn't me executing any game plan. It was you know, or anything like that, but, but you feel a huge amount of pressure because you see some of these hopes and dreams. You see somebody who is, is doing, um, you know, everything possible to make themselves the best they can be for that moment and the expectation of the line. You don't, you don't, and you know, if you say one thing, you know, and it's wrong or it's, it's not, it's not taking a step in the right direction. It's like, you feel like, you know, you have this little lever with this giant crane, you know, and you touch it wrong and boom, <laughs> that crane can do, it can, it can destroy something or it can build something, you know? And so you really choose wisely. Uh, you really listen more than you talk and, um, and you try to learn more than you teach, you know? And I think that part was, um, that part was different and, and, and I gotta say challenging, um, and any, anything problem solving, um, is something I find, uh, you know, enjoyable. Well, thank you so, so much for being on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This has been so interesting to <laughs> chat with you. I really can't thank you enough. Oh, I could chat with you forever. This is uh, this is fun. Well, good luck with with uh, this moving forward. And thank I you. know our roads will cross one way or another. And uh, thanks for your time. Oh, thank you for your time. Thanks so much. Take care. Awesome. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening to tonight's episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm Zibby Owens. You can read more about me at zibbyowens.com. But please subscribe to my podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books, on iTunes, Stitcher, or Podbean. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.